want to say I'm here. Sorry. Hi, Go Nandini. Ahead. Welcome. Uh, we'll just about to start now. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, welcome to a new Indonesia project global seminar. My name is Arianto Patundru. I'm hosting this program with Lydia Napitupulu. We acknowledge the first Australians and pay our respect to elders past, present, and emerging. We are grateful for the support from the Australian National University and the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, today's webinar is part of our series on gender equality and social inclusion, GESI. I'm very pleased to introduce Licia Erza from Apindo, that's Indonesian Employers Association, Diana Oktari from Melati Nusantara, part of ASIC's a supply chain integration firm based in Indonesia and Singapore, and Nandini Hari Hareswara, an independent consultant formerly with UNCDF. They will talk about SME development and gender inclusion in Indonesia uh, with a focus on the experience of Malati Nusantara, a nationwide program that assists entrepreneurs, especially women entrepreneurs, to help their business recover from COVID shock. As usual, we will have Q&A session after the talks but if you want, you can write your question anytime on the Q&A box, not on the chat box, and we will attend to them after the presentations. Please also kindly respond to the little polling on your screen. We need it to improve our series. Thank you. And uh, with that, let me invite first uh, Ibu Licia to kick off the discussion. Over to you, Licia. Thank you. Thank you, Masari. Hello, everyone. Familiar faces. Hi, Nandini. Hi, Dana. Uh, right, so maybe a bit of a background for you know, colleagues, friends who are attending who are not familiar with Apindo. So Apindo was established in the 1950s in Indonesia and to date it is one of the oldest and largest trade associations in the country. Uh, the membership is I think around uh, 14,000 companies. Uh, and out of these 14,000 companies, it is spread out across all the 34 provinces uh, and districts in Indonesia. And we have a committee uh, within Apindo, so it's not just large companies, which is more you know, in the news coverage, but we do have a committee that looks after SMEs. And within this uh, committee, uh, do at the committee uh, was look into how we can use uh, different policy tools and advocacy uh, to make sure that SMEs also have representation uh, in the country. I'm trying to get the slides to move. Uh, forgive me. Uh, this doesn't seem to be moving. Um, right. One second. Right. So. <laughs> Uh, I think now we have it up the country. So when we look at SMEs and also gender, uh, we start looking at the data. Globally, out of 195 countries, the world still has 115 economies with laws <laughs> preventing women from running businesses. 167 countries have at least one law that restricts women's economic opportunity, which is quite alarming because this is 2022. Um, but in Indonesia, when we look into the demographic, you know, less than half of the women are in the workforce. Uh, even if they are in the workforce, uh, there are still a lot of them in the informal sector or you know, household industries. And then when we look even deeper, a majority of these women have low, medium skilled um, workers. So that makes up about 43 million people. So what does that mean to the, to the sort of like the entrepreneurship uh, environment? Um, recently, uh, we started looking into the women's economic empowerment frameworks that are available around the world. And what we see are pretty much similar to what the Indonesian case is looking like. There are still um, you know, norms and cultural practices that uh, still are barriers to women's uh, you know, economic improvements and then the legal aspect of things. And then what's even worse is the assets and digital financial properties where women uh, need that to then advance their businesses. Then of course, we start looking into business cultures, business practices, uh, some of the very simple ones, you know, why don't you want to succeed in your business? And then the lady would say, well, if I get rich, 
then my husband will have a second wife and then all like half my wealth will go, will go to these, uh, to the, to the new wives. So things like that become barriers to entrepreneurship and also the policy uh, recommendations that, that we make. So one example we look at is when we talk about financial and digital capability, it's not just the financial literacy. These days, we also need the digital literacy. Then we need to have the financial capability to then be able to be included in the digital financial uh, space. But then when we start uh, deep diving into even one area like this, we started looking into possible uh, enablers. For example, asset ownership. Are things registered under the female name or under the, fa the male family counterpart's name? Brothers, husband, you know, cousins, um, you know, father. Uh, and then when we go into the institutional framework, we start looking in, are there uh, sex disaggregated data? Do financial services use this or only collect this um, with no uh, inclusion purposes? Are the instruments designed for women or are they still you know, a bank uh, lens and which are a lot of, uh, of them are, are asset backed? Uh, and then we start looking into the ecosystem. How do we create an ecosystem both policies, the service providers, and also the enablers can work together within the same framework. And then, of course, we talk about the social constraints uh, in women's inclusion. But then these days, we work a lot with technology, and we have to start being aware as well about the algorithmic biases that uh, there are available. So it's not just about male and female roles in the society, in the economy, but when we use different technologies, uh, there are, you know, tons of, of digital uh, platforms that, that now uh, do people use to access finance, the sample data collected by an online app um, or digital credit companies are a little bit like this. But in reality, you know, still a lot of women don't own mobile phones. Nandini later on might, you know, touch upon it. It's a second generation women users of technology. But 57% of women globally, even though we do have financial accounts, it's still less than, uh, w uh, than men, uh, for example. And then there are about 200 million uh, fewer women than men uh, having online access or, or mobile phones. Even if they do have mobile phones, they still have to share it with their family, their children, education, and so on. So algorithmic bias is something that we are also uh, looking into. So as an association, we do have some pillars uh, that we work with. Uh, first of all, of course, the entrepreneurial capacity, the skills development around it. But we also build partnership with universities, with the government uh, to create this um, ecosystem and also an environment where uh, it is more efficient. It is easier for women, for women to be involved in, in value chains. Uh, and what we understand in Indonesia is that there are still fragmented bases of data. You know, different ministries, different organizations have their own SME data, uh, which makes credit scoring becomes difficult. Again, if we look back into the algorithmic biases, uh, you know, people start collecting things from you know, your Facebook, your Instagram, your social media presence and posts, and then tying that into your credit scoring and you know your likelihood uh, to not return uh, any loans. Uh, so then it becomes quite predatory uh, in a sense. Uh, so the association also promotes um, partnerships with different uh, bodies, including what we have now is with uh, entities who are uh, working on the sustainability or environment aspects of things. So it's not just about um, money, 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 but it's also people, profit and planet. Uh, and because Indonesia is quite rich in its uh, cultural and creative um, backgrounds, we work with you know, creative markets and cultural markets around that. Um, and we do uh, select the priorities uh, that we have every year, uh, making sure that it's not just about the micro businesses, but also the smaller ones so that they can move up uh, to become medium companies. Um, and this is also in line with the Bank Indonesia's uh, clustering of which priority SMEs that uh, we should work with for different programs. Uh, and then if we look at chains and explaining this to SMEs, uh, we started you know, explaining to them, you know, something that's simple, you know, from soybean to tempeh to, you know, fried tempeh, but then we do have something that's intangible uh, uses. Uh, and then we have something that's a little bit more complex, uh, which are in the heavy industries, um, you know, when we see that it's involving, you know, rubber farmers, you know, and also uh, mining uh, companies. And it goes all the way to even SMEs that becomes distributors or garages uh, to fix things. So we try to explain to SMEs where they are within the supply chain uh, 
and supply chain so that they can manage uh, their businesses a little bit better. And what we also in introduce is that when people talk about capital, it is not just about financial capital. It is also your environmental capital, social capital, um, material. And these are some of the areas where uh, SMEs tend to find you know, it's very difficult to obtain capital, whereas actually they're quite rich in other type of capital. Um, in terms of the capacity building, we're also starting to cluster different SMEs in terms of their capabilities. Are they, are they still a one-person type of operation or have they started employing uh, people and then having uh, the appropriate legalities, um, certifications and, and licenses to operate? And that would help them grow uh, along the way. So uh, within the committee, what we believe is that different entrepreneurs have different entrepreneurial journeys. Some of them are still at an inspirational stage. Some of them are you know, already engaged, but not sure how to move forward with their business. So we try to, to have you know, different programs, whether it's the core competency development, technical development, and behavioral development. And for each of the pillars that we work with, we work with you know, the government, the ecosystem, uh, international organizations, uh, so that we have not just the competencies, but also the regulatory framework that supports these uh, competencies. So within the organization, we try to have uh, a unified, um, I guess, platform where we have a portal for SMEs and you know, people who already have businesses uh, can you know, find business services, communities they can be part with, uh, they can be part of business matching programs, or if they're in any specific sector, there are programs that they can join. Uh, and then there are master classes delivered by people who are you know, companies that are more mature, you know, sharing their experiences and even operational tips. But we also provide you know, inspirational sessions for people who want to start their entrepreneurial journey and looking for ideas so they don't end up just producing, you know, banana chips or batik again or into something else where actually Indonesia has a lot of sectors uh, that do need an uh, entrepreneurial approach. And these are some of the partners we work with. Um, say, for example, if it's an agriculture, we work with a large uh, agriculture machinery company where they share how to use machines in agriculture, how do you use data in agriculture, uh, how do you then optimize you know, which crop cycles, uh, et cetera. Uh, we work with entrepreneurial competitions uh, like Diplomat Success Challenge, for example, where they give a grant, uh, a working capital grant at the end of the program and follow on mentoring. Um, another one which is quite interesting is uh, Utomo Solar Roof. So they are a roofing company, quite large, but they are uh, educating SMEs and uh, sort of like construction material shops on how to manage and sell uh, renewable energy uh, solutions for, for housing. So we do have these programs uh, within the organization. And what we try to educate as well, is not just about the revenues, but it's about the profits and about their working capital. Uh, on average, unfortunately, Indonesian, uh, for, you know, half of Indonesian businesses pay late. So they, they, the suppliers have to manage their, their working capital better. And when we look into the trend uh, uh, in, in it's about 37 days being the average uh, payment cycle, but then because half of the businesses are late, generally payment durations in Indonesia take 57 days, which is roughly about two months. Um, during COVID or, or you know, 2021, it extends to 70 days, which means the business have to manage at least three months of working capital to replenish their stock, to pay their staff, uh, and this becomes a crunch uh, uh, generally. Uh, later on this year, uh, Apindo and a couple of will be publishing 20 years of Indonesian working capital index. Where we did a research on you know, the last 20 years, what happens with working capital in waste financing. But when we look at different types of financing, especially when it's women, there are other options where women are not aware, where they have you know, minority interests, shareholding uh, options, uh, vertical integrations with their um, supply chains. Uh, and these are the things that we try to educate, uh, which is not easy, not complex, but somebody has to start. And as an association, we feel that we have, we are in a better position because we have you know, thousands of members all the way, you know, from upstream to downstream uh, and midstream of the supply chains. Uh, so we have different capacity building uh, programs 
Uh, Dana will talk about Malati shortly. Uh, we have uh, partnerships with the universities to do uh, research and in-depth training with management teams. Uh, and we have something that's a little less uh, uh, formal through our you know, Wednesday sessions. Uh, at the moment, we have an eight-week series how to export uh, your products uh, uh, from Indonesia. We work as well with uh, organizations and government. Uh, this is an example for our partnership with the government of Japan, where we see that the SMEs need to recover from, from COVID, but in doing so, it is an opportunity to introduce sustainability practices uh, so that they can recover greener and also more inclusive. And the, out of the, I think around 1,200 participants, uh, we do have participants, majority women, but also uh, people with disabilities joining the program, understanding that they are also part of the um, entrepreneurial um, ecosystem. Um, so this is an example of some of the posters we have from, from our sessions talking about, you know, what's the QR code? Uh, wh what, did, what does that do in your packaging? You know, how do you read uh, contract uh, agreements? You know, how do you then uh, develop your bakery business? Does it mean to be you know, a modern farmer or a fisherman? Um, and then how do you transform from just a, a home industry to a full-fledged uh, industry? Uh, so we, we invite different uh, partners, uh, ecosystem um, actors, uh, and sometimes we also go deep dive into certain industries. We have a partnership, for example, with Sasa, or which is a, a spice company uh, in Indonesia, pre-mixed herbs and spices. And they teach uh, SMEs who provide you know, food products and food services, you know, everything from how to cut your chicken, how do you then run a business of you know, fried chicken packages or, or stalls. Um, we work with uh, a bakery uh, business, uh, Baker Biz, uh, teaching them everything from product development in cake and, and breads, uh, all the way to running the business, product development, R&D um, standards, etc. Uh, we do the same in textile, we do the same in food. Um, so uh, we do uh, quite a number of things as an organization, but at the same time, we also try to provide a platform, a technology platform to avoid that algorithmic earlier, uh, where we have ecosystem partners on the same platform, SME uh, practitioners on the same platform and also the larger companies within the same platform. Uh, one example of how we use this platform was recently, um, I think last year at the mid, uh, in the middle of COVID, uh, there are uh, hospitality chains who are planning on having you know, SME products within their hotel amenities. And they re uh, requested that we help them curate the SMEs, the products, and the regions where these hotel chains uh, have their operations. And this platform makes it easier for us to see who already has a license, who's already registered, you know, good um, e-commerce reviews, etc. And during that curation process, the hotel ch chains will also educate the SME who want to supply your goods to us. These are some of the requirements that you need. Uh, to fulfill. And we did the same with some retail, uh, uh, some factories also you know, share what their social compliance um, requirements are. Um, so as, a, as an organization and as a committee, um, in terms of our advocacy work and also our capacity building work, we try asking ourselves, you know, are we doing enough to ensure uh, not only that women have the economic uh, capabilities, but are we doing enough so that these women with, with these businesses participate in larger uh, value chains? Um, and then, of course, when we break that down, uh, we see you know, what macroeconomic policy levers can we use? And are there enough budgetary resources uh, to improve these opportunities? So we work with district governments, central government. Um, are we also facilitating the creation of decent work? Um, sometimes women do enter the workforce, but then when they have families, they start falling off. Um, and we're also looking at, you know, safeguarding a greater collective voice for women. Um, around 20, 30 percent of API, um, uh, officers, I suppose, are, are women. Uh, so we are involved in policy making. And uh, what we try to do now is future proofing women's inclusion given that we're living within, you know, Industry 4.0, Society 5.0, uh, et cetera. Uh, so that's what we do as an association. I'm uh, happy to take on questions uh, later on. Thank you very much, uh, Alicia, for the compre comprehensive overview. Um, 
let's now turn to Diana for the next talk. Uh, Diana, over to you. Uh, we cannot hear you. Uh, test? No. Hello? Yes, good. Okay, thank you. I will start the presentation. Okay. I hope you guys can see my presentation now. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Pari, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Diana Oktari. At Essex, I am heavily involved in SMEs and also rural economic empowerment initiatives and our mission with wide range of stakeholders. So let me introduce you about Essex. Essex is a group of companies that specialize in supply chain finance and collaboration services. We are connecting buyers, sellers, and also suppliers and others uh, through our secure web-based technology called ASIC Supply Chain fi Finance Management. Our strength is in digitizing land-based supply chain, particularly in FMCG and also agriculture businesses. We work with national and also local government agencies to map and also develop sustainable SME supply chains across various rural parts of Indonesia. So this is our five pillars of ASIC Business Unit. We provide a cloud-based financial supply chain management technology, a sustainable supply chain which comply with international standards. In this case, we are using GRS standards for our programs. Moreover, we do help our partners and financial instrument design, provide advisory support, and also run supply chain finance research learning center by working with educational institutions and other partners. We also provide an integration of physical, financial, and also digital supply chain solutions that allows clients to manage multiple buyers, multiple sellers, and also multiple financial services on the same platform. We call it, our platform is ASIC Exchange 4 or X4. Also, we are happy to announce that this year ASIC has won world's best provider of sustainable financial solutions in supply chain finance from global finance in Europe. So let me introduce you Melati Nusantara program. First of all, Melati Nusantara is supported by Women Enterprise Recovery Fund, which is funded by Dutch Entrepreneurial Development Bank, the government of Canada and Visa, and implemented by the United Nations Capital Development Fund or UNCDF, and also the, the United Nations Economic Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific or ESCAP with support from the Australian government. So a deep dive about Melati's program. Let's take a look at the background first. In Indonesia, we have 64 million MSMEs that dominated by micro, -entrepre micro entrepreneurs. Over 60% or 40 million of these MSMEs are led and owned by women. But women entrepreneurs in Indonesia are prone to crisis and exclusion from supply chain finance access. As a business is in growth stage, they need a non-financial services to support their growth. So Melatino Santara program is designed to support women entrepreneurs recover from the impact of COVID-19 for their businesses through an integrated entrepreneurial development program. Financial government and also supply chain finance facilities in Indonesia. And also, the bigger goal of this program is to promote and scale digitalization supply chain finance solutions for the women entrepreneurs in Indonesia. These are the list of activities that how we can support our participants in Melati. So, we have online class and also mentoring. We also introduce our technology. And then we have Melati's friend, which uh, participant can uh, discussion and also have community uh, among each other. And also this is our IA e-learning, which is a self-paced program. As we can see from this picture, this is our e-learning media platform. We are collaborating with our partners to provide the learning modules in online scheme. To date, 
Melati has more than 2,000 MSMEs registered with 73% of total human users. And also with its self-paced and open learning environment, the modules that can be accessed by all women across the country, including those in rural areas. Participants are also given free access to ASIC supply chain management technology, which is X4. These are uh, our learning modules. Lati provides a wide range of learning modules topics, such as uh, about digital and also technology, businesses, and also supply chain finance, and also uh, another topic such as sustainability, tax, and also gender equality. Moreover, we also produce a series of special modules, which is, uh, as I, was, as I have uh, mentioned before, about gender equality and also marketing issues, uh, such as copywriting and also another topic that uh, can more engage with our participants. And also we have one-on-one -on -one mentoring session with experts. For those who had completed learning materials, we'll have a chance to one-on-one -on -one mentoring session with our expert teams. As we can see in this slide, our participants were able to discuss with our mentors in terms of their business development. So we are not just a learning platform program. Melati Nusantara is also a community for women entrepreneurs. As we can see, Melati's weekly comics can help participants understand a complex, com complex business concepts in a simplified and also a fun way. We create more than 15 characters, which is in reality, we often meet these characters in real life or in our business activities. So these are our uh, characters that we uh, provide in this uh, program. And also, this is our, uh, our Malati social media, sorry. Uh, so we have uh, Instagram and also a website and we can find our uh, material in uh, platform, which is in Top Career, in Top Edu. Also, this is uh, our partners. We work with uh, more than 20 partners uh, across Indonesia. So we have institutional uh, education uh, partners and also government to local government uh, association and also uh, such as APINDO and then another uh, incubators or uh, organization in uh, local uh, places or in the field. So uh, that's all about Melati Nusantara. Thank you and let's collaborate. Over to you, Parian. Thank you, Ibu Diana, for the explanation about uh, Melati Nusantara. And I think we can now move to uh, Nandini, who will provide some uh, comparative perspectives uh, about these activities across the region. So over to you, Nandini. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us for this uh, really interesting, very, um, what I like about it is it's very practical conversation about uh, what we can do to improve women's digital and financial inclusion in the region. Um, and I also want to thank um, ANU for hosting this uh, lovely talk, as well as Licia, who invited me to be part of this uh, conversation. And so thank you to all of you. Um, I'm very, very pleased to be here. Uh, my name is Nandini Hariharishwara. I'm an independent consultant, but prior to that, I worked for the UN Capital Development Fund, and that's how I met Lishia and her team, and several other teams focused on increasing the number of women in platforms um, using e-commerce platforms or digitally enabled financing platforms, much like Lishia and Diana described to you today. And so, um, one, one of the things that we did was we spoke to uh, 13 uh, different, uh, 11 to 13 different e-commerce and digital lending platforms across Asia. So that included Indonesia, that included Vietnam, Nepal, uh, Cambodia, um, and Bangladesh, 
and Indonesia, right? So across these countries and even more, um, we spoke to several platforms. And, and one of the things they all were working on in collaboration with the partners that Dina, Diana mentioned is uh, trying to increase the number of women users in their platforms. And so after talking to all of them and understanding what their challenges were, um, there, there are about eight or nine buckets, categories of challenges that they went through. And so today, what I thought I'll do is just give you a taste of, an, of, of a flavor of understanding of the different kinds of challenges they've gone through. I love in the Q&A, um, if our colleagues will allow even in the chat box for people to um, share their experiences as well on these things. If you don't know what things are or want to understand more, feel free to put it in the formal Q&A as our moderator suggested. Um, and then we can have a very robust Q&A after, um, after my talk. So the first challenge, of course, is COVID. We've got to talk about COVID first, right? Um, many businesses closed down. Many businesses had to stop for some time. Depending on what the lockdown scenario looked like in your country, um, often you weren't able to transact. You weren't able, if you had goods and services that you needed to travel in order for logistics to work, in order for your business to work, often uh, business had to either stop completely or be postponed. Uh, especially for women, the mobility issue uh, was even, even more increased uh, because in some countries it was very, very difficult to, there was no public transportation, everything was closed. And so often women are more reliant on public transportation than men, and therefore their reliance on those transportation uh, pieces of their business is even higher. Um, there is also a reduced lack of trust, especially for new products, given the high risk of the environments that we were in and are in, in some cases still, it's difficult for um, women to potentially trust new products and some of these new products that these uh, companies like ASICs were coming out with uh, in that time. The second uh, category of challenges was around really understanding what a user's journey is. This is a very, um, very common analytical tool that digital and digital finance companies use, which is called a user journey analysis along the road of from completely not knowing what your product is to becoming a super user, right? Like using it all the time and even telling all your friends and family about it. What is that journey look like? And what are the challenges or what we call the headaches along that journey? What are the problems that happen for users? And what often happens is one, depending on the sophistication, Alicia talked about, there's this spectrum of sophistication of companies, right? It depends on when they started and whether they have any other companies, et cetera, right? They may, A, they may not have done the analysis at all with a user itself or a set of users, right? And it's really important to do this kind of analysis with the users themselves. Um, not with someone from your company that thinks they're the answers. And so, or you haven't done that user journey analysis in a while, right? You should be doing it at some frequency. Maybe it's quarterly, maybe it's semi annually, how fast your product rolls out. But it's really important to do it with a set of users. It doesn't have to be a huge number, it could be even five, 10, 20, but really understanding what is their experience because they themselves can say what are the challenges and the plus points of your product that need to be addressed or maybe even highlighted more in the marketing given the, its benefits to the user. If you have ever done a user journey, if you want to know more about user journeys, please put questions in the Q&A or in the comments um, and share with us what your experiences have been. We went through a fake company we called Bamazonia um, to just walk through, well, what could the experience be for a user of a Bamazonia product? And what would be the things easy, like how are they
selected and how are they pitched? Um, how do they decide that they're using the platform? And then if they're borrowing money, how soon can they know that they will get that loan? And I think that's one of the things Alicia mentioned in her analysis as well. Um, the third element, which is very important, is how, what are the elements of recruitment, right? If you want to increase the number of women users in your platform, how are you recruiting them? And that's kind of a number one question, right? And so there seem to be three ways that all of these companies recruited women users. The first one was partnerships. They had partnerships with fellow financial service providers, often microfinance institutions. They had partnerships with associations. They had partnerships with local government. They had partnerships with the NGOs. And these proved to be very, very useful. Alicia and ASICs and Diana have mentioned that they have several partnerships that, that have helped them increase recruitment because often it's in these uh, associations or NGO programs that they're already building the capacity of women and women who could be potential users. So it's quite useful. Um, sometimes, depending on the partnership, for example, if it's a microfinance institution, it's really important to understand, well, first of all, if you have, let's say, investment uh, loan officers recruiting for you, what is their gender, right? What is the gender dynamic and the power dynamic between those loan officers and potential users? Do they have a previous relationship? Recording is it a new stopped. relationship? Recording in progress. Things like that. So it's important to understand what is the gender dynamics between the people that you're using as that intermediary partner to help recruit, right? The second is IOC. I didn't know what that meant before I started studying this subject, and it means informal online commerce. Um, in fact, ASICS and Malati is one of the only contenders using Instagram as a uh, recruitment tool. Many others use many others. Facebook is very popular in the region, and of course, WhatsApp and other, uh, other forms of interaction. And so uh, what, what we shared with them was a very interesting analysis done by CGAP of the World Bank that helped us understand what are different kinds of profiles of women that use this product. And Diana did a wonderful job showing us some of the personalities, some of the personas that they've developed um, that describe how the product can be used and, and the different stakeholders you might interact with as a user of their product. So that's a great way to better understand your customer profile. What is it that they like? What is it that they don't like? What is it that they're comfortable with? And what is it that they're less comfortable with? And so, um, in fact, there was a little bit of an underutilization of IOC from the partners studied. It was only six out of 11 that used them. And so, uh, you know, definitely this seems like a platform that's underutilized and can be more utilized by many others. And often women might be more comfortable, especially in these online platforms. Uh, the last form of recruitment is agents. Many of you might be familiar with agent networks and digital financial services settings, and the challenges are quite similar. Uh, the questions are whether or not you've really invested in your agent network around recruiting for women. Are they trained for it? Do they have the right materials? Do they understand the particular challenges that women might face in your market? Uh, around using and um, utilizing the platform. Uh, and the other question is really what are the, just like in when we talked about partnerships, what are the gender dynamics? Are most of your agents men? Are most of your agents women? How uh, do they have previous relationships with women or the ways of women you're trying to recruit? And what do those relationships look like? Um, the other area around agents and partnerships is, and are really leveraging everything you can. There are lots of women's groups. There is a few good companies. They all uh, have um, potential uh, in terms of uh, being recruited or being part of your recruitment process for increasing the number of women users. So there's several others, but I only had 10 minutes to speak and I think I'm almost at time. 
but I'll just go over them quickly. So there is the, the know your data uh, ca category. And this is something that both D Diana uh, uh, Licia spoke about. And it's really in this world that we live in, fourth, the fourth 4.0 society or web 3.0 or whatever you wanna call it, data is gold, right? Data is, and so the extent to which companies invest in knowing their data and that's people so do you have people that know data and how to collect it uh policies do you have policies within your institutions and platforms do you have the technology to collect and analyze the data have you made those three investments because if you don't recording really stopped. know recording in progress if you don't really know what is the uh, what is the gender of your customers? If you don't know the gender of your agent network or your partnership development network, if you don't know um, how active they are versus just being registered customers, if you don't know those things, it's very difficult for you to be able to really understand how to iterate your product to make it better. So if any of you have used data, especially sex disaggregated data, to iterate your product, please let us know. Please tell us your experiences, or if you have any questions on that, please put it in the Q&A. It's one of the most important elements of developing products and having a more inclusive uh, society for women uh, in every country, really. Uh, and often it's one of the biggest challenges. Many companies, even some of the companies that we worked with, actually don't collect sex disaggregated data. They do it by hand. So they look at their database and they they say, okay, this name looks like it's a male or a female, and then they do it. And, and it's quite, um, at some point, it won't be sustainable. Um, there's a role of trust. So I talked a little bit about the importance of being able to trust a new product. Um, there's the first versus second generation challenges. So, so in some of the countries that uh, where we work to try to improve women's digital and financial inclusion, uh, the, we have a set of first generation problems. Women don't have access to phones. Women don't have access to bank accounts. And they have some of these very fundamental basic digital literacy problems that Lishia spoke about. Um, that's what we call, that's what I call, actually, this is just a term I came up with, first generation challenges, right? So how do you help move beyond those barriers and challenges? You sometimes in some countries and even in some geographies have second generation problems. So women have access to phones, women have access to bank accounts, they have basic liter digital literacy, but they're not able to get to that second level. Something we actually heard from the ASICS team is, well, many of the women that we work with know how to use WhatsApp. They can send a message on WhatsApp, but we need them to upgrade and be able to send a message by email. And that's something they are learning how to do. And so that's some of those second generation challenges around what happens after a woman has a bank and a phone account, sorry, a bank account and a phone, but what do they do next? When, what are the challenges they face? And still there are many challenges they face. The next are social and cultural norms. In many of the countries that we work in, social and cultural norms are one of the reasons or one of the fundamental barriers for why women are not included, why they don't have a phone, why don't they don't have a bank account. We even heard from the A6 team and from several others that once a company is doing very well, sometimes, if, if especially if it's a family company, they might say, well, you know, the women are really good at the detail-oriented stuff. Let them focus on the product and the men are better at management. Let them be the leaders and let them manage the business. And that's, you know, sometimes a social and cultural norm and expectation um, that, that can prevent women from growing as leaders within an organization and can prevent their advancement in digital literacy um, and, and digital financial inclusion as well. Um, lastly is chicken and egg. And this is kind of a all-encompassing challenge for many of the companies that we work in and many of the challenges that I've listed, right? And really, that's about, well, where do you start, right? Many of the companies that we have need to have users on the platform for some time before they can start offering a credit product because they're offering a credit product not based on collateral, but based on a, a digital tr transaction history. So you have to have a transaction history or at least some information for them to get started. Um, in some platforms, especially e-commerce platforms, you're looking to increase 
increase the number of buyers on the platforms, retail users, and you're looking to increase the number of vendors, but you have to have the right mix of users, buyers, and sellers on the form. And especially the, the sellers should be selling things that the buyers want and vice versa. And so these are some of these chicken and egg problems. What comes first, the chicken or the egg? What comes first? Do we start focusing on vendors? Do we start focusing on the retail users? And, and usually the answer is you have to work on both at the same time. And so the question is, how do you work in this dynamic platform to make sure that you have financially successful platform? And um, any of the answers to this question actually back to some of the challenges that we've talked about, right? Investing in your agents, investing in your partnership development platform, investing in data and really understanding your data. So when there's a shift, you immediately notice it and you know what it means and you know what it means for your product. So these are, um, you know, eight or nine of the challenges that we found by studying platforms like ASICs and others in the region. Um, but I'm excited to hear about and understand is that these have made firm commitments to increase the number of women users, and some are not having problems at all meeting their targets, which is really exciting. Um, and many have learned a lot from these categories and are working on things like user journeys or agent journeys to really understand what those challenges are. I expect that many of you on the call today might also have expertise or questions about many of the things that we've talked about today. So I'll turn it back to the moderator um, to take us to the next step. Well, thank you so much, uh, Nandini. Very interesting stories um, you tell us there. Um, I see one question and one hand raised. Um, uh, let me check if Rini Astuti want to ask her question directly. Rini, are you there? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, thanks, uh, 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 Arianto. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so my questions to uh, Lisha and Diana. Thank you so much for your uh, very interesting presentations. Uh, my question is on, um, is there any uh, particular initiatives uh, addressed to um, women's or farmers groups in the social forestry uh, areas? Uh, as we aware that the government of Indonesia has this programs to open uh, access to 12.7 million hectares of forest to forest users group. And that one of the initiative is to also uh, and if you do have uh, experience in empowering these groups, what are the challenges that you found so far? Partners. We started working with uh, environmentalists and also international organizations uh, like World Resources Institute. Uh, we work with uh, the Peatlands and Mangroves uh, Authority in Indonesia, looking at how uh, smaller businesses uh, with environmental interests can be empowered. Uh, and that actually launched uh, a, a sh like a string of activities that we have uh, explaining uh, to both sides, both the regulatory um, uh, actors of so local governments that sometimes there is a, a dilemma uh, to protect the environmental interests in peatlands, for example, um, people shouldn't be doing any economic activities uh, on these types of land, where on the other hand, uh, there is also a belief that to protect uh, these you know, forests and, and peatlands and mangroves, we have to involve the community as you know, part of the ecosystem. Um, we, uh, we started uh, working with uh, Pantau Gambut, which is a peatland monitoring platform uh, in developing a business hub where SMEs can get access to uh, training organizations, uh, investment partners, um, how they can place themselves to be more investable uh, as uh, a crossover uh, type of business. Uh, and at the moment, we're also working with a foundation um, with social forestry in Sulawesi Tengah, or Tenggara, oh, in Sultan, uh, where 
there are a lot of pineapple plantations in the area and pineapple uh, typically would be sold for the fruit, but globally, the textile value chain also takes use of the natural fibers that you know pineapples can, can uh, produce. Um, so we work with the foundation, which has a retail and fashion arm, um, but developing the local community to be producers and developing their entrepreneurial journey uh, in, in the in the sense. Um, I think as far as challenges, I mean, there are many challenges. Dana can also uh, maybe share uh, a little bit uh, of the you know, challenge in, in Rio. Uh, so we do have some programs. Uh, we would like to do more. Uh, sometimes it's difficult as Apindo is known for like this big entrepreneur organization and then they they have this perception that what are these large companies doing in uh, social forestry and the environmental uh, agenda. Uh, so sometimes even with good intention as an organization, the people's perception of the enabler suddenly becomes a little bit skewed because of what people read uh, in the media. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, Diana, would you like to comment? Yes, uh, I would like to add in what Alicia have said uh, about the uh, what Barini just asked. So in Essex itself, we have Huri program, which this program to facilitate a growth stage or mid-market agri industry businesses. So for example, in Essex, we uh, empower the farmer groups and also uh, women in West Java uh, particularly in Subang, which actually uh, they produce uh, pineapple, but uh, we look at the value chain uh, of the pineapple itself. So we found that uh, in Subang, uh, even they have a lot of uh, pineapple produce, uh, producing a lot of pineapple, but uh, they haven't used the uh, pineapple leaves in a maximum ways. So uh, we collaborate with local farmers and also women weavers in Subang to uh, maximize the use of uh, pineapple leaves. Uh, for example, we work with them to, uh, to maximize the use of pineapple leaves, leaves for a uh, fiber, for a, uh, what we call, what we call uh, serat nanas, serat daun nanas or uh, pineapple leaf fibers. So uh, these fibers actually already uh, produced by the local farmer, but in a small uh, size. So we help uh, to bridge the sustainable supply chain market. So the uh, local farmer can work with other buyers, which is uh, we found buyers from Singapore. So uh, the product, the fiber itself can be more uh, produced uh, from now, they more than a hundred uh, fiber uh, leaves uh, produced in a month, and then uh, they send the fiber leaves to the Singapore or our buyer uh, monthly. So uh, these are, for example, for our uh, sustainable supply chain program in Essex. We also have another program uh, such as uh, what Bulisha have said. Uh, we are working with Apindo to work in uh, another places uh, about the. Um, Midland. So we work in Hulu Sungai Utara, also in Siak. We uh, look at the uh, pitland commodities, which is, uh, we call it a purun. Uh, this purun also uh, produce a lot of products, uh, home, home, uh, home care products. And also uh, from that program, we have, uh, also we have a challenges, which is um, as we can uh, understand now that the local people actually have a lack of confidence when we talk about the technology, when we talk about the businesses, and also they uh, quite hard to find a support system to develop their business in local or even in national level. So that's a challenge that we need to uh, collaborate together. So uh, the local business and also uh, we as uh, people who can help them to, to scale up their business can uh, collaborate together to help them. Uh, I think that's a kind of example from Essex. Uh, back to you, Pak Arianto. Thank you, Ibu Diana. Uh, next, I see a question from my friend from UKS West Salatiga, uh, Henry Sandy. Henry, do you want to ask that question directly? Henry, are you there? 
Oke, okay, silakan Pak. Oke, okay, selamat pagi semuanya. Good morning. This is to some extent a, a question to Bu Diana, but maybe also Bu Lisha and Bu Nandini may have uh, something to say about it. I mean, uh, I am interested to understand the sustainability of the programs. Uh, what you did not discuss, whether women have to pay for these services. If these are provided for free, then maybe later on you'll get a problem once uh, your programs stop and who will then step in and take over. So I'm curious if you could say something about how you will think about the, uh, the sustainability of the program and in particular whether women have to pay for the services. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Henry. Maybe we'll start with Nandini first. Nandini? Thanks for the question. Um, in terms of payment for programs, um, well, it actually would be better for for uh, Alicia and Diana to speak to the payment for their programs. But most of the projects and most of the platforms that have been examined don't require payment, uh, right? The the business model is such that the participation of women in these programs um, uh, creates uh, a, you know, a profit for themselves itself, right? So if it's a supply chain lending platform or if it's a lending platform, then the way in which the business model is structured is that the women apply, um, they give the data that's required. And then um, if they are for a loan, obviously it, within the business model isn't, interest rate that um, allows the business model to be financially successful. Um, if it's a platform that is for digital or financial literacy, which often is coupled with all of these things, you might have digital and financial literacy, much like ASICS and Malati have, as well as a financing platform. Um, that digital literacy package comes for free because it's to the benefit of the business for the product user to be more digitally and financially literate. Um, so most of the time, as far as I've studied, there is no cost to the woman user. Back to the moderator. Thank you, Nandini. Diana? Okay. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Pahen. So basically, for Melati Nusantara program, absolutely 100%. So uh, our, our participant can uh register and then they can uh, follow the can you speak more loudly diana can you hear me? yes i can hear you maybe louder please now we cannot hear you diana hello yes good can you hear me okay yep. so uh for to answer pa henry questions uh, about the uh, Melati Nusantara program. So Melati Nusantara program 100% free for our participants. They just have to register and then uh, follow the step for the how to access the modules and also how to access the uh, our X4 products to use by the participants. So it is 100% free. Then uh, if they can access the modules, they have uh, they have to make sure that the internet. Uh, it's quite stable. You can access all the modules uh, online because it's. Can, a, can I follow up on that, uh, Budiana? Yeah. So, how do you finance this activity? So this, uh, as I as I have uh, mentioned before, that this program fully supported by UNCDF from our donors. So uh, this program actually for our participants. Uh, so this is what we like to empower participants to join this program. This is 100% free, and then they can have, they can have uh, all access to the modules, and also they can practice in our uh, supply chain management tools freely for more than. And, and if I may, has there been some kind of evaluation to the activity and the possibility of uh, scale up if it's considered success? Sure. So with our donors, we actually monthly have a weekly uh, report. So uh, we introduce and also we give us some report of our progress in program. 
So this is also the uh, how our our donor to see whether this program should be continued or not. There are some, uh, what we what we said. Uh, uh, we can say that uh, in every month with our donor, we can see uh, there's a progress. So when when we can see from the participants, when when we see from the uh, participant uh, activity in our platform, we can uh, that this program can continue uh, to another years. Uh, so this is the reason why this program actually free, and then why can actually continue to another years. Uh, Hopefully. Well, thank you. Uh, Alicia, you have something to add? Yes, I think uh, what we're seeing these days is more like a shared value uh, process where you know, companies would look at a social problem uh, and then they see that there is an investment to be made uh, in that uh, solution into the social problem. Uh, and then at the same time, other parties, uh, say, for example, donors, uh, philanthropic uh, families would see that as a way that they can contribute back uh, to uh, the development or the solution of that program. What we're seeing as an organization is increasingly private sector and also uh, the social environments uh, would have a combined uh, blended finance uh, solution, for example. Uh, so an NGO would work with a private sector who understands that landscape. Um, there's knowledge sharing, that's where value comes from. Uh, but then at the same time, financial institutions would see that uh, in order for them and their business model to sustain, they need to support the, these activities. So there are non-financial um, uh, activities that they, they do. So for the longevity of the program, yes, it is um, catalyzed by organizations such as UNCDF, uh, Government of Japan, UNDP, et cetera. But then uh, throughout the program, when the program is you know, showing uh, good progress, good, um, I guess, results uh, from, from the monitoring uh, area, then these parties would then start having financial instruments to kind of cross subsidize uh, with these empowerment programs. So as part of the organization's uh, you know, private sector um, operations, they would then allocate a percentage uh, of the operational cost into these empowerment uh, programs. Uh, one area that we're looking into at the moment, so APINDO, um, the Investment Coordination Board, uh, BKPM, and also some of the other uh, ecosystem uh, partners uh, are launching a sustainable investment uh, initiative this year where there's the ESG readiness uh, uh, para, uh, parameters where NGOs, uh, the business community, and the impact investment community look into what ESG parameters they need to publish so that everybody can work together. But then at the back end of it, the investors, uh, the financial institution providers are looking at it from, okay, if I develop a product uh, and this product can be profitable over uh, a period of time, then it is a worthy investment to support these programs, make sure that this program then develops into something um, uh, more like a support system for their main uh, instrument. And we're seeing uh, an increase uh, in, in these types of you know, shared value uh, collaboration. So it's no longer a CSR type of uh, activity, uh, but it becomes a um, uh, a phased approach where initially it's the grants that started it, but then the company would uh, increase their investment and co-funding into that. And then another party would then follow on uh, with their part of, of the activity. Thank you again. Uh, next on my list are Ibu Tri Mulyaningsi from ONS Solo and Nurina Merdikawati from ANU. Let's start with Mbak Tri. Yeah, thank you, Pajo. Uh, I hope you have a good day. And everyone, thank you for a very nice presentation. Uh, I would like to ask uh, how to reach out the women entrepreneurs that, that are digitally illiterate. Um, as we uh, observe, there are a lot of groups of uh, women entrepreneurs which are all uh, digitally illiterate. Uh, and I think I see from your program, most of the program are using digital infrastructure and, and platform. So perhaps you can uh, respond to this question. Thank you. Thank you, Tri. I think uh, this goes to Diana first. Uh, 
You're still yes, muted. Hello? Yes, yes, good. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, so this program, uh, it's true that it's a, it is actually 100% online, uh, but we are actually looking uh, looking at this condition now, which uh, the COVID-19 quite low now. So we are actually have a program to uh, do this program uh, hybrid and also offline uh, session. Example, this week we uh, will have um, Latino Center program in Solo, uh, in uh, Central Java. So we actually try to both uh, ways. It's actually uh, online site, but also in offline site. Uh, given the time that uh, this condition uh, already quite stable, rather than uh, last year or even uh, in a pandemic session, uh, pandemic uh, phase uh, before. So basically, we are trying to do both. So it's not only uh, in online ways because we also understand that uh, people in rural area actually quite hard to find the access to the internet so we are going to do that program online and also offline thank you thank you thank you uh nandini information from other countries in the region Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, I think this is a great question, and it's it's one of the challenges around e-commerce and digitally enabled platforms because they do have a prerequisite that you are somewhat digitally illiterate. But when I kind of probed further, many of the platforms have online and an offline option. Many of the platforms leverage agent networks and partners have online and digital capabilities to essentially be proxies for women entrepreneurs who maybe aren't there yet. Um, and so many have solutions, right? They go out into the world thinking that, okay, most of the women that they want to work with have access. And when they discover that they may not, or there's a, there's a mix actually, we took a poll with those that we, uh, we provided technical assistance to, and when I asked how many of you are working with first gen and how many are working with second gen, um, there was a mix. Almost everyone said, actually, it's a mix. So I think when you know that there's a mix of uh, capabilities of potential users, you adapt and you try to help them get there. And there's various ways to create bridges from them being not uh, digital literacy, not digitally literate, um, not having um, capability or access to phones or bank accounts to slowly, slowly get them there. And often that's an intermediary that's already playing a role as an intermediary to help them get there. And that's all very common with a lot of digital platforms, even digital finance platforms, mobile money platforms across the across the world as well. Thanks. Great Nandini. question. Thanks. Uh, Alicia, you have comments on this? Uh, yes, I mean, yes, there are a lot of programs delivered um, online, but what we see, you know, ex for example, Apindo has representatives in all the provinces. We try to do more hybrid setups where we technology friendlier for women. So if you know, women do want to learn, uh, they can, you know, send a message to a pindo and say, hey, I need to learn about this. And we'll try to organize something that's more of a hybrid. Or even if we can't do that, at the very least, what we try to offer is, can you go online on Zoom? Most of people, you know, are uh, familiar with Zoom or Instagram Live, or even a, a like a, a video call uh, on WhatsApp, where then the program owners would you know, talk them through, you know, click on the top left, <laughs> click on the bottom right. And if they're afraid of making mistakes and are pushing the wrong button and then you know everything like uh, the world's not going to end, even if you make a mistake, uh, there are support systems that we try to, to provide. Um, and one way uh, of, you know, getting people to be more familiar with these technologies is by, you know, being able to provide a support uh, mechanism uh, so that even if they're not familiar with the platform, they can ask their you know, family or friends uh, to help them do that. And in some of the, the Apindo training sessions, what we also encourage is that they bring along um, either their children or their family members who then becomes their peer learning um, uh, 
uh, ada teman belajar. So there's a like a study group uh, that they have among them and they can teach each other uh, how to use different platforms from e-commerce, finance, uh, HR, um, and also e-learning um, uh, mechanisms. So it's really getting them used to different types of technologies. Great, thanks uh, Alicia. Next is uh, Nurina Merdikawati Dika, you there? Go ahead, Dika. Um, thank you, Pacho. Uh, I think I have questions uh, related to Melati program. It's really amazing uh, in terms of how the program uh, has done so many things and then reach out to so many uh, micro and small uh, entrepreneurs. I think my question is, do you have any idea in terms of uh, like how many uh, entrepreneurs that have been uh, in this program and what are the basic characteristics in terms of are you well educated or not so much and then i think you mentioned about the percentage of female enrolled in this program but what about the geographical outreach of your program are they all based in jakarta in java island mostly because i just want to get a sense whether uh, the outreach of this program can really uh, go into uh, to really probably need uh, the support uh, the most. And also, uh, I have a related question uh, with Pa Acho regarding the impact evaluation. I think the question about impact evaluation, uh, of course, you have to collect more information in terms of uh, their capacity, their knowledge about certain things before the program, and then once they are in the Malati program, and then how uh, the knowledge can be improved. And then, of course, if you really want to really pin down the cost of the improvement in the knowledge is because of this program, then they may need some randomization involved. So uh, how is it like the plan for that going forward, especially if you really want to make sure that this program uh, is sustainable, it's going to be there for a long period, because I realized that it just really started in 2021. And then I think it's such a waste if it only lasts for like few years, because it will take some time before we can really see that the, these programs uh, have, have a very significant impact on the entrepreneurs, especially the micro and small entrepreneurs out there. Thank you, Dika. Uh, over to Diana. hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So thank you for the question. For the Melatinus program, we actually, uh, for now, up to uh, to date, we have more than 2,000 MSME awarded in our program. Based on that number, actually, we have 73% of uh, participants were, uh, uh, are women users. So uh, actually, in this program, even we are... Uh, we, we, we are actually uh, focused on women entrepreneurs, but also uh, it, it is welcome for other uh, or for female, uh, for male, uh, uh, for, for, for male users to uh, use this program also. And uh, when we talk about the location in Melati Nusantara program, since we are doing it online and also we are going to do it in offline uh, scheme, well, actually, Melati Nusantara uh, open for all over uh, places in Indonesia. For now, the geographic uh, profile for uh, Melati Nusantara participants uh, quite uh, distributed from all over Indonesia places, such as uh, we have participants from uh, West Java and also uh, some participants from Kalimantan and also from Sumatra. Uh, so we are trying to... Uh, uh, to make this program more uh, familiar with other places in Indonesia also. Uh, over to you, Pak Arianto. Thank you, Ibu Diana. Ibu Lisha, do you have more information or shall we move forward? Uh, we, we try to have, like for the measurement of impact, there was a question on measurement. Oh, of that's impact. right. Um, so what we try to do are different things, uh, different measurements. Uh, for example, the behavior um, impact, for example, you know, through training programs or business matching uh, that Appindo has with uh, ecosystems, uh, do people's behavior from something uh, as simple as not uh, taking note of their transactions to having that change uh, of behavior uh, in their day-to-day -day businesses or also in the attitude that people have towards compliance and towards you know something as simple as tax you know SMEs uh, generally have you know different uh, tax break schemes uh, subsidies and programs 
Uh, what's the attitude change, whether it's not so much uh, or far to be, you know, paying tax, but at least registered as a taxpayer. Uh, that's one uh, attitude change that we try to measure. Uh, and also the situation. Uh, is the business then uh, growing or are they then uh, getting a change in the situation on how they can uh, see where they were previously not part of any supply chain, and uh, now they are moving towards more B2B uh, partnerships. Uh, and then, of course, the knowledge uh, that we look into. Recently, we started looking into the impact pathways where you know, these businesses, when they change one element, you know, going green, for example, are they then uh, being part of an you know, impact investment networks? Are they then um, you know, being able to track their use of water, use of energy uh, you, in, in some areas where you know, forestry or environmental uh, uh, concerns are, are, are part of it? Uh, are they then able to track the carbon impact, not so much for carbon project, but at least the, the knowledge and the environmental impact that they have. So in terms of measuring how much impact we have, it depends on what program, uh, but we always try to look at it, not just from a technical impact and how many jobs are created, what's the increase in the income, but also in the behavior and attitude uh, that we create uh, uh, in, the, in these changes. Thanks. Uh some of the audience uh, are actually students. Are, are you open to the possibility to share data with the students and, and if they want to make uh, some kind of research based on your activities? We do. Uh, and I think Apindo also works with universities. So we work mm. with University of Indonesia. We work with uh, University of Widya Kartika for different things. Uh, what we can't provide, of course, are personal data. Of course. But it's like trends and needs, some of the white papers or you know, policy briefs that, that we write. And you know, we're always open for inquiries. Um, and recently, I think we also work with PhD students uh, from business schools so looking into impacts so of different aspects of, of SMEs. Excellent. Next, I'd like to invite Lydia. I think she also has a question for, for you. Lydia, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, you have mentioned about algorithms and that they can be predatory towards business owners. Um, this is something that I've been thinking about because uh, we, Indonesia Project, is also preparing a conference in May about how algorithms uh, is affecting competition. Um, so my question is, do you work with like KPPU, Komisi Persaingan Usaha, or maybe OJK or others um, about uh, algorithms that are predatory towards business owner and I think maybe even discriminatory. Um, this was something that you explained. So um, that's the first one. And also, uh, do you work with more informal? Uh, I guess you mentioned something about encouraging to have tax identification, etc. So is this a case that you are encouraging uh, business owners to be more formal? Um, and uh, you know, what, what, what is the mechanism for you to encourage them to be more formal? Mm -hmm. Because uh, especially you had mentioned that they like selling through informal channels, WhatsApp, Instagrams, as Nandini mentioned. Um, so that's from me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so working with you know, algorithms, uh, it's, it's really hard to explain about algorithms, uh, particularly to policymakers who are, a lot of them are not tech savvy. Uh, so as an association, what we try to do uh, are two things. Uh, when the businesses find that they are victims of predatory um, you know, practices, we try to look into whether it is by nature predatory or do, is it a perception that it's predatory uh, where actually they, from the beginning, they didn't have the understanding that they will be scrutinized for their financial reports, for example, and that's normal in a due diligence process. And that's not something that's you know, predatory uh, in terms of like uh, loans and, and things. But there are also instances when we look at it and we see this is not right when uh, the loan provider 
then starts looking or messaging uh, their private uh, networks uh, to get you know, loans paid or uh, for social pressures. And these are the things that we, you know, on a case basis, on a case-to-case basis, work with either Ojeka or the police force where we, we encourage you know, police uh, or um, authorities' understanding of what's happening. Um, we try to then connect them as well with uh, organizations that do provide legal advice, but more from a corporate uh, law uh, point of view. So it's not just um, LBH or legal aid uh, in general, but uh, more from a business governance uh, practice point of view. But for the algorithm uh, argument uh, that we're trying to build, and that's why we have that platform where SMEs can register themselves, is that we're trying to, to uh, I guess, educate the market uh, on a benchmark for credit scoring. Indonesia doesn't have a credit scoring agency that works you know, nationwide that becomes one benchmark. And this is the reason why different organizations have their own versions of you know, credit scoring um, and algorithm building. Uh, that's on the loan side. But from a business point of view and how people then compete using different algorithms, uh, that is something that we can't control because you know, like Alibaba, for example, in China, they have a huge number of you know, data, uh, their transaction data, and they work with manufacturers uh, to launch you know, different products uh, and giving advice to what the trend in the market would be. So people who do have the data then have the advantage uh, in the competition. But it is very hard to then prove that any particular company is using a particular algorithm uh, to be able to compete. And in a free competition, you can use whatever you want as a strategy. And we can't, you know, it, sometimes we can't prove it. Sometimes we see that as being unhealthy, but that's the reality. Uh, and the challenge that we have at the moment is also with the internationals that do have better data structures uh, and then understanding the Indonesian market better, uh, which leaves not much room for Indonesian businesses to then be able to compete because we're blind, we're lost uh, in, in the amount of data. Um, so we are trying to build these kinds of understanding. Uh, uh, so A, understanding it, and then knowing how to use it, and then using it effectively. So there are three different uh, phases that we need to do. Uh, and, and then for us, understanding that this becomes key, like data becomes key, algorithms become key, it would then be hard for smaller businesses to not be part of this data movement. If they stay uh, as an informal business, then and you know, by default, it, they will be excluded from different things where the agenda is leave no one behind being inclusive in business, being an inclusive economy. And that's why we try to encourage, yes, of course, you'll be you know, scrutinized for your tax reporting. Yes, you will be um, seen uh, in, in how you operate in, in, in the business. But by going more formal, it also opens up opportunities markets that use ERP or you know, digital sourcing platforms can understand that you exist. Uh, investors who want to do diligent uh, a, a small business would be able to do that easier once you go more formal and you have official documents, you know, an invoice at the very least, showing that you have a trade relationship with another business. Um, the way we encourage uh, these SMEs to then become a little bit more formal, um, A, of course, by having um, digital profiles, whether it's a social media account, an e-commerce account, and then uh, further up from that is, do you have formal invoices or contracts? And then further up from that, you know, do you have a partnership agreement with other companies? Uh, so we try to, to use that spectrum of entrepreneurship journey uh, in taking them from something that's informal to a little bit formal uh, and removing the fears. I think uh, a lot of the fears are you know, tax driven or compliance driven, uh, but then for that giving the sense of safety that it is okay if you go formal. And once you go formal, it actually opens up more opportunities than the compliance or the tax uh, fears. Uh, and we try to, to give them an understanding Taxes are not the government trying to rip you off of your you know, hard work, but even when you were born on your way to the to the clinic or you know even electricity, you've enjoyed the country's facilities, and then now it's kind of time to pay it back. Uh, so we, we try to change people's perspectives on you know, how they see tax compliance uh, and regulation. Thank you, Alicia. 
again, I'd like to hear from Nandini if she has some observations about this matter from other countries. Nandini? Uh, I think Lisa has covered it uh, okay. quite well. So I think I, I'm going to uh, pass on this one if that's okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a little bit on that then, uh, Alicia. Uh, well, maybe they are not, um, I mean, they're okay uh, to have taxpayer numbers and things like that. But being formal also means probably they have to adhere to labor policy, for example, minimum wage laws and things like that, right? Um, are there any pushback from SMEs, from small uh, businesses on this matter? Because probably they cannot afford to pay UKM for their workers. Mm. Uh, yes. Um, so uh, recently there is a case where one region changes their labor policy, the minimum wage suddenly becomes very, very high. Uh, but for SMEs, uh, it's always a dilemma. If they then becomes formal, they are bound to these regulations where it's actually geared towards larger businesses. Uh, so they then resort to paying less. What we try to educate uh, some of the SMEs as well is that there are models that are not based out of like minimum wage because you're like, you have a monthly salary, but it can be output based where it is more flexible for uh, the SMEs to then adopt, you know, the unit of outputs, for example, is something they can they can understand, comprehend, and it's fair. We also try to give them, you know, different partnership models, uh, understanding if you're working in a partnership, so maybe it's a revenue share or a profit sharing model where it's it it's not um, uh, un, it's not uncommon. You know, people do that as well. So when they are, you know, these SMEs probably have two or three uh, workers uh, with them that early stage profit sharing revenue sharing model will probably suit better than having to pay minimum wage that are you know, exhaustive uh, for these communities. Uh, but then in that pushback, sometimes our challenge as an organization is getting the SMEs to also understand you have a voice and you can voice your concerns through organizations such as us. And Apino is not the only one. You know, there are communities, there are different associations, and you can voice your, your concerns. Um, and it is important for us to also educate the, the government uh, and also people with political interests that sometimes uh, what they uh, shape for larger companies uh, are irrelevant for a majority of, of Indonesia. 99% of Indonesian businesses are small. You can't afford that. Uh, and you're only targeting the very, very small, like 0.2% of the business who can afford. And it's not all, uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, trying to exhaust people and people's understanding of what labor means. Um, you know, we, we find content creators you know, labor, we find developers and technology engineers as labor. So it's not always just the low skilled ones. There's a full spectrum that the government also needs to understand. And that's what we're trying to communicate to them as well. Well, thank you so much. With that, our time is up. I'd like to thank all our speakers. It has been wonderful discussion. Uh, our guests have been Licia Erza. Diana Oktari and also Nandini Hari Hareswara. Thank you again so much. And I'd, I'd like to also thank our uh, audience. And with that, let me turn back to uh, Lydia. Maybe she has some announcement. Lydia, over to you. Hi, thank you, uh, Acho. Um, from me, this is the last online seminar for this month. Uh, if you are in Canberra, feel free to attend our event on the 30th, uh, which is a meet and greet with uh, the new, new-ish ambassador to Indonesia, um, Dr. Pramono. So with that, uh, thanks again to everyone and see you in April for an online seminar. Please check our websites and social media channels for the schedule. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. I'll close up after I tabulate the poll. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.